It is a huge honor today to be uh, interviewing a fellow Irishman, Anthony Meekham. And he tells me uh, I'm Irish uh, Catholic, and he tells me that Meekham was, was uh, when, uh, when, I, when the Irish guy introduced someone, he said, uh, me what, what, how did you say it? Well, this guy didn't have a name for whatever reason. He's like, oh, well, this is me chum. So me that's, chum. that's where the name Meekham comes from, supposedly. I, I don't know if you can confirm that or not. So, uh, hey, so you're a uh, you're a new age uh, oral radiologist, and uh, and that's the uh, the American Dental Association has nine recognized specialties, and seven of them are clinical, and then two are non clinical uh, public health and oral radiology. And well, you're I might the, lump pathology in there with non clinical. I don't know if you consider that non clinical oral pathology. Okay. So. Okay, I'll give you that. I, I just go by the uh, the. Uh, their own press releases where they say seven are clinical, two are non-clinical, clinical, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a pathology is non-clinical. Um, but um, getting the biopsy is a little clinical. But um, this is all new age, and in my walnut brain, being uh, 52 years old and uh, graduating in 87, that this, uh, this new specialty arose probably from the machine of uh, x-rays going from 2D to 3D. Yeah, and I basically a, a bunch factor. of dentists all sitting around thinking, how do you read this thing? I mean, I, I have a uh, 3D X-ray. I don't like the term CBCT because I think it's confusing. I, I think all Americans understand, you know, there's 2D movies, there's 3D movies. It's just like a 3D uh, radiograph. And, I mean, I have the one from Carestream, and I look I look at those pictures, and it looks like I'm looking at something from the uh, space shuttle, uh, the, the, the <laughs> Hubble Space Telescope into deep space. And they're just hard to read, aren't they? Well, I appreciate that you actually admit that. You know, a lot of people I talk to, you know, they've read radiographs forever, and so they think, well, what's what's just another modality? We can interpret that. We can read that. So, yeah, you know, first time you look at it, it's it's really confusing, and it takes some time to get used to. It takes a lot of education, a lot of additional training, I think, than what you see in dental school to really be able to read those. Well, I'm in a, I'm in a group practice, so, you know, there's always been uh, about three of us uh, for the last 20 years, and there's usually a dentist uh, popping his head in there every day from somewhere, whatever, and uh, I can't tell you how many times three to five dentists have been looking at a CBCT, and we're all pointing right. to something and saying, what's that? And no one knows, and sometimes it's just uh, um, crazy great. So so tell me yeah. this. So you got out of dental school in 2009, right? Mm-hmm. And, right. then, and then you went straight into uh, a residency and uh, oral path, or no? Actually, I did a just an AGD residency with the Air Force. So I signed up with the Air Force, did the three-year HPSP scholarship program, and I was up in Alaska for a few years with the Air Force. Oh my God, that's the that's the most beautiful state in the country. Oh yeah, yeah, you've oh, been there. Oh my gosh, I have. I I flew there. My my dad and my brother, we went up there and uh, we flew into uh, Anchorage, drove down to Homer, went halibut fishing, then went and uh, rented a helicopter on the Kenai and went salmon fishing up on where no no there weren't even roads or cars, and then we uh, drove all the way to Prudhoe Bay. Oh yeah, uh, I agree. It's, it's amazing. amazing up there. We were kind of so, sad to leave. So the Air Force uh, taught you how to read these things, huh? No, actually, I, then I when I was done with the Air Force, I did the oral radiology program. I didn't have that much experience in the Air Force. You know, we had a comb beam CT, and I'd look at it with our oil surgeon once in a while, but, you know, far from being prolific at interpreting him. And what what made you go into this? Uh, a lot of different factors. You know, I, I always thought I wanted to do some sort of specialization. I've considered each and every one at some point. Uh, Dentistry is kind of hard on me on my back. You know, I'll just go ahead and say it. I have ankylosing spondylitis, I have back problems with doing dentistry. And I was looking at different things that are non-clinical, and you know, this was, I didn't even realize at the time that it was a recognized specialty. So I started looking into radiology. I uh, went to the 2011 AAOMR meeting. I was in Chicago, and I just really loved it. I really thought there was a huge future in radiology, and you know, still I see a huge need for it out there. And what and um, what would you say to? Uh, so how long have you been a specialist in this? I actually my my last official day of residency was yesterday. Awesome. So today, <laughs> today's my first day of freedom, first day of actually starting, you know, trying to start the private practice of radiology. So so let's just let's just start out of the gate with the uh the big million dollar question is uh, no, not a million dollar question, the $150,000 question. <laughs> Do you think a general dentist should buy one of these for their office? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I did a little research for this. You'll probably agree this is uh, really high-tech research. I used Dental Town. I asked of solo dental practitioners who own their own comb beam CT, how many of them thought it was profitable. 
Uh, most of them said they broke about even. Uh, only 14 responses said even, but 12 of them said no, and only seven said yes, it was profitable. And so for a solo practitioner, you know, likely it's not gonna be profitable. Of course, you have other things to consider. Uh, if you're gonna be taking a, doing a lot of implant plants uh, or a lot, of, a lot of the tricky endo where you might need a cone beam CT with a really high resolution to try to see you know, if there's possibility of fracture or perforation. If you're doing a lot of those things where you're gonna be using it, obviously it makes sense to get it. And there are other considerations other than just the bottom line of am I gonna take enough cone beams to make it profitable. You know, obviously it's, it's kind of a marketing tool for your practice. It's, there's a lot of benefits about it. Uh, but I don't think every practitioner has to own one. You know, obviously it's a huge investment coming out of dental school already with a ton of debt. Maybe $150,000 more is the last thing you want to think of. Uh, and I'm going to quote Gordon Christensen here. You know, he said he thinks everyone should have access to a cone beam CT. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot of things that, that make sense with kind of the imaging center. Uh, you know, having someone that just does that all day that's able to really specialize in getting the best images possible. And then also, you know, they'll be outdated every few years. Well, maybe every five years they come out with a, a new and updated cone beam CT. And so just trying to be able to keep up and have the new and the best out there. I think there's a lot of advantages to doing imaging centers. But uh, unfortunately, some of the people I've talked to that have these imaging centers, they're, they're not doing that well because everyone wants to have their own. And I understand that mentality too. You know, I think if I were a general dentist, I like staying on top of technology. I like having all the new bells and whistles. And so, you know, I understand both points of view. But, you know, again, I think as long as you have access to a cone beam CT, you know, like you've said before, if you don't have one, there's tons of specialists out there that have them. And, and likely they'll, they'll be friendly to a request to just refer a patient for a cone beam CT. Are there any national um, radiographic centers for oral uh, radiology that are coast to coast in all 50 states, or is it mostly just little city by city companies? As far as I know, it's kind of city by city. You know, there are specific ones in each state. I don't know any that have a national wide brand that, that have their own, you know, across all the state borders. Do you, do you know the names of any regional players? Uh, we'll, we'll probably have about 5,000 dentists listening to this from uh, all over. Uh, is, are there any? names off the top of your head that some of these guys might uh, look into? Well, I'm in Utah. That's kind of where I'm planning on ending up and where I am right now. And I've talked to the guys in Utah. There's uh, Oral and Maxillofacial Imaging Center in Salt Lake. And so that's kind of the center of the population in Utah is in and around Salt Lake. And that's in Murray, Utah. Then also right in my hometown of South Jordan is Ultradent. Oh, yeah. And they, yeah, they have an imaging center. But both of them, they haven't been that successful at uh, getting a lot of referrals. I guess people just want to have their own. And have you met Dan kind Fisher? Of trending. Have you met Dan Fisher? Uh, no, I didn't meet Dan Fisher. Oh, I my God. a couple of the guys there. Just go in there and tell him that uh, Howard Ferran uh, said you got to <laughs> shake his hand. He is the neatest guy in the world. He is, nice. He, he, nobody works harder. Nobody's more nicer. Nobody's more – he has so much integrity. I mean, he's just nice. – he's just one of my top five role models – in life and dentistry. He's just an amazing man. Yeah, well, the people I met there, they were, they were really impressive, and I actually applied for a job there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you think, uh, are, 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 so you're still looking for a job there? No, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm mainly going to try to make this radiology thing work out, private practice radiology. I think so, there's a so then, um, if someone takes a CBCT, do you think, um, so a board-certified oral and maxillofacial radiologist should, uh, should read them all? Uh, that's a good question, kind of the, the elephant in the room right now, especially with a lot of radiologists. You know, I don't want to make people mad with my opinion, but I do, <laughs> do have my opinion. You know, there's a lot of doom and gloom radiologists out there that say, you're an idiot if you don't refer every single scan that comes out. And you know, I kind of agree with that sentiment, but I, I don't want to be one of those guys. I don't want to be, you know, you're, you're an idiot for not referring, you have to refer everything to me. And the main reason is, you know, if we made a law tomorrow that said, you have to refer every cone beam CT to an oral radiologist. There just aren't enough of it's out there. And so, you know, with dentistry, a lot of times I think you have to think of what's the best possible outcome for the patient. Uh, maybe it's not always about what's ideal. You know, if we talk about what's ideal, I would say have at least two radiologists review every cone beam CT because even the, the top radiologists out there, uh, you know, I wanted to give a shout out to Lars Hollander. He's, he's a the professor emeritus at University of Washington, 
who we all love and respect. I know Dr. Gonzalez, when she was on here, she mentioned him as kind of being a mentor and influencing her decision to go into radiology. But, you know, even he'll admit he, he doesn't think he sees everything, and, and he stays awake at night worried about what he doesn't see. And so, you know, I think if we went by the ideal, in this case, for radiology, we'd have at least a couple of people who know what they're doing look at it and, you know, okay, that everything's okay. But, you know, then you do have to make that, that decision. You can't always do the ideal. You know, dentistry, if we always did the ideal, everybody would get a gold fill or a gold, you know, the gold fillings or the gold crowns. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're, we've gone far away from that. And so I think we're left with what's, what's the best thing we can do with the resources we have. And right now there's only, say, about 200 oral radiologists out there. And there's only a lot 200? More. I, it's, it's a tough number to keep track of, but I think it's around 200, maybe even less than that, that are board certified. And I'm not board certified yet. It'll take another year before I take both the exams. Uh, but oral radiologists who are out there actually practicing, the number is even less than that. You know, a lot of oral radiologists still just work for schools and are, are happy to be involved in academia and doing research. And so if what I was starting to say is if, if we made a law tomorrow that every cone beam needs to be read by oral radiologists, we just couldn't keep up with it. And so I think we need to do the best thing that we can, and that's improve the education of the general practitioner. And... You know, I think everyone would admit the education we get in cone beam CT in dental school is is fairly minimal to none. And so, like you said, you start looking at those things, it looks like you're looking out in outer space, something you've never seen before. You know, it takes practice and it takes training. And, you know, I think there's a huge need out there, and I want to start making some online courses. You know, we talked before about uh, maybe doing some links to that on, on Dental Town. But I definitely want to start developing some online courses, start, you know, developing training for general dentists to be able to read to interpret cone beam CTs. So let's let's start with uh, let, let's start with a, uh, a dentist. Um, I, I always try to guess questions. What what are the most relevant questions for my listeners? <laughs> and um, we kind of hear that um, like if you're an endodontist that you might want a specific brand of machine because it's better at a, just a, like a tooth level. Whereas if you were an orthodontist, you would want a different type of machine. Is there is there a machine now that can do any dental procedure from A to Z, or is or would you be giving different recommendations of machines to buy to an endodontist versus an orthodontist versus someone that's just doing implants and surgical guides? It'd probably be different recommendations for each. You know, endodontists, of course, they're can you concerned. can you go through those um, for for the the types of different dentistry and actual name brands? Uh, what? I don't know the name brands and specifically which ones would have have. You know, I know Kodak with Carrying Dream, they do a lot with endo. So they probably have a lot more the the high resolution stuff, but if you know specifically what you're looking about, without really going into name brands, endodontists you know are going to be concerned with the high resolution stuff, and you know all of them advertise now they have super high resolution, super small voxel size, you know down to below 0.1 millimeter voxel size. But another thing you need to consider when looking at resolution is not just voxel voxel size, but focal spot. If you if you have this 0.1 millimeter voxel size but your focal spot is five millimeter, or 0.5 millimeters, that's like having a super ultra high def television, but you're only getting standard definition signal. And so there's a lot of different things to consider. As far as I know, you know, they may be coming out with newer and newer things every day. Of course they are, but as far as I know, Prexion has probably the smallest focal spot of 0.15 millimeter. Prexion. It's where, not a very common one. Where is that? Where is it, what country is that made in? I'm not even sure where, where they make those. It's just something I've, I've looked into. Uh, something I should look into more. You know, and maybe some of the newer models of some of the more common brands have smaller focal spots, and that might make a big difference. And again, this is all kind of theoretical that I'm going by. But I'd like to see some of these images, not just from what the vendors show you. Of course, they all look great. But you know, some actual in-use machines that are installed in people's office and see how they really look. And so I guess maybe as a call to action, if anyone wants to send me you know, images, if they have a Prexion from any different brand, I'd, I'd love to take a look and uh, you know, really see and compare the two because it, it's tough to compare just talking to the different vendors because you know, they'll say anything to sell to you. And, so, and, and their images always look great and top quality. And so you know, it's just certain things you need to consider. When you're looking at endo, it's the high resolution. When you're looking at, 
you know, TMJ or ortho, you want a larger field of view, and so you have to get one of those that does the expanded field of view. And you should start another thread on Dental Town asking that. Yeah, for sure. S yeah. Setting up the picture. Um, did you see the? Uh, it's all over social media. Uh, Consumer Reports uh, put out a deal on uh, is your dentist. Uh, taking too many x-rays or radiation. Did, did you see any of the Consumer Reports articles on... Uh, Is that referring to that article a few years ago about bite wings causing meningiomas? Yeah, I think there was a 212 a two, a one, and, and then they just had another one in 2015. I just saw it flying all around the Internet uh, I didn't see the newest last one, week. but you know, all those are kind of along the same vein. And if it's similar to that 2012 one, which was you know, kind of a hack job, kind of just a scare tactic trying to scare people and, and they kind of got what they wanted you know they got a lot of attention with their headline bite wing radiographs dental radiographs cause meningiomas cause brain tumors which if you look at the way they did the study that it was about the worst you could do you know it was all based on just anecdotal evidence looking at memories of people and x-rays that were taken up to 70 75 years ago and so just just a really poor study and you know another questionable thing is some of those, well, the, the bite wings showed more of a correlation than a full mouth series of x-rays. And how you can explain that, I don't know. Um, so there's really not, I don't think, a lot of good information that should scare us into you know, saying bite wings are, or dental radiographs are causing. Well, on that note, let's just go into, um, now that you're uh, a new graduate, you should have a lot of this data fresh in your head. What, what is the criteria of... Uh, when to take x-rays on, on a new patient. I mean, uh, uh, some practices, uh, just every new patient, they take an, an FMX and a pano. Some take a mm -hmm. pano and just bite wings. Mm -hmm. um, some take it every five years, I think, because the insurance pays every five years, and they assume, well, if the insurance pays every five years, that they're they good with that. take a pano every five years? Uh, well, I mean, or, or an FMX or whatever. But, 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 what, but can you walk through the um, when you would take x-rays? Well, none of the any, guidelines. Any, yeah. I think what's the most recent from the ADA, like 2012, and none of the guidelines so. explicitly say it. It, it kind of gives you a broad range, and you know, the, uh, for each category. And again, Dr. Gonzalez referred to that paper. You know, we could put another link in, into that ADA recommendation again. Uh, but you know, once when you have a new patient, you know, I don't think FMX for new patient is is always the ideal thing. But again, with these guidelines, it, it leaves it all up to interpretation, it seems like, where you know you leave it up to the, the dentist's best judgment. And so well, there is I, a lot of variation in there. Well, go through. Okay, I'm 52. I just come into mm -hmm. your office today, and I, I'm a new patient, and uh, you just mm -hmm. met me. And, uh, you don't bring any x-rays with you? No x-rays. You know, if you're 52 and I see maybe you've got a lot of dental work, I, I don't have a problem with doing a full mouth, mouth x-ray, a full mouth series of x-rays, doing a panel. You, you know, if it's someone younger with, with obviously not a lot of fillings, maybe you do a pano and bite wings, and that, that's probably sufficient. And, and do these um, 3D CBCTs, uh, do, you, um, do you think that's a, a too much over-radiation to get a pano and, a, and uh, bite wings? I mean, because some of these CBCTs, don't they extract a two-dimensional pano and a four mm -hmm. bite wings out of it? Yeah, and I was at uh, the recent Utah Dental Convention you know, looking at the different uh, CBCT machines, and now Plan Mecca has this ultra-low-dose radiation comb beam CT, you know, as low as like 15 microsieverts, which is about the, along the lines of a pano. And, and so I, I said to him, you know, are we going to stop doing panos? And it, it seems like it may be heading that direction. You know, if a pano is the same dose, you get just the same, or you get better information from a comb beam CT and you can recreate the panel. And some people have problems with the recreated panel, uh, but I think you can get over that because the real complaints about the rec recreated panel is you don't see those shadows and things that you're used to seeing, which aren't really diagnostic or helpful anyway. So does it also recreate the bite wings? Off a, off a cone beam CT? Yeah. Or the, the panel? The Plan Mecca one? I mean, you said the Plan Mecca one will recreate yeah. a panel. Does it also recreate bite wings? Uh, they advertise it as recreating bite wings. You know, I kind of think anyone that's really a proponent of that is, is really trying to sell those. If you look at them side to side, the pano bite wings compared to regular bite wings, I think hands down the intraoral always look better, and it, it just seems like you get a lot more information. They said they were going to do some research pretty soon in the future and, and to stay tuned. 
So, you know, we'll watch for that research to come out to show, you know, maybe it is diagnostic. Maybe you can get a diagnostic bite wing from a panel, even if it doesn't look quite as pretty. But right now I'd say we'll, we'll still have intraorals. Those are still kind of the way to go to look at bite wings, to look at intraoral carries and things like that. Well, I'll tell you what, that is one hell of a company. That's uh, Pam, Plan Beckett's in Helsinki, Finland. When I was in mm -hmm. Helsinki, I went down to the, uh, the company. I mean, wow, those guys are intense. And I think one of the reasons they're so intense is because since it's so damn freezing for half the year, <laughs> I think everybody decides just to stay in and work their ass off. Uh, but it, 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 the, the work ethic up there in Scandinavia is crazy. And I do, I do think it's weather-related. I seriously do. Because a lot of dentists told me um, when I was in Sweden and Denmark and Norway and a lot of those countries, I say, well, you know, there's not much to do in the winter anyway. So I usually get to work at 6 in the morning and usually don't get home till 7 at night. And then I take all of August off. So I, that's kind of how it. That's kind of how it was in Alaska. You know, everybody would work long hours in the winter. Oh, yeah. That's all you have to do anyway. And then you know, take great big fishing trips, go and what, all night and what's, so, and what's so hard about visiting those countries is when tourists go there, like, uh, you know, like June, July, August, when it's most beautiful, all the locals are like, hell no, I'm not working and I'm not waitressing <laughs> and I'm not cooking. I'm, I'm going yeah. down. You know, I, I'm, the, the parks were just filled with all these people laying out and playing and, you know, <laughs> having fun. Them. And the restaurants were uh, be like one poor waitress, and she had like twenty <laughs> tables to wait on. So it's kind of a it's kind of a tough deal. So, um, what do you think about uh, what, what if a person wants to uh, do implants? What what do you think of the surgical guides from the point of view? Do you think the surgical guides are as accurate as these people think they are? I mean, a lot of people think, well, this CBCT, you know, it's down to the microns. Mm -hmm. So if I made a surgical guide and it's and and it had a stop point here. It absolutely, I'm never going to hit the mental frame or the sign. I'm never going to hit anything because this thing is just too exact. Is it exact? Is, is it that exact? Or can you really uh, still? I think as far as having the, the stop point, you know, that's something that can be controlled pretty well. Of course, there's wiggle room inside the sleeve. And so, you know, as accurate as you can get, you can, you can be a little off with the sleeve. But, you know, as far as the measurements, those are, those have been shown to be accurate. They are pretty reliable. And, you know, if, if I were asked if I recommend them for doing implants for each implant case, you know, it's probably good to get started out. You know, I know Gordon Christensen recommends not doing them for healthy patient single tooth implants. And, you know, that's fine. Of course, everything takes practice. You know, maybe, maybe the first few you do, you want to have a guide just to make sure you're doing things right and make sure everything's lined up. But, but yeah, I do think they're accurate. I, I think it's been shown those cone beams are, are pretty it, it, predictable. It's, it's a tough controversy because... Um, for, you know, since 94, 95% of all crowns and or implants are done one tooth at a time. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the full mouth uh, rehab market is just a fraction of the one tooth dentistry sure. market. And, um, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the old timers and a lot of the oral surgeons think, well, you know, you need to learn how to be a surgeon. You need to learn how to lay a flap. And you got a tooth and that's in the front and back and you lay a flap and you see the bone and... And you, you should mm -hmm. be able to do this. And so a lot, a lot of those guys just say, you know, just, just, just lay a flap and do it. And then, of course, the, uh, everybody wants to do everything faster, easier, yeah. lower cost, better. And it just seems, uh, you know, well, if you snapped in a circle, I'd right, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a big controversy. I wrote my next column on it that month just because I knew it would, uh, I knew it would be uh, um, the ball where everybody needs to talk about. So, so what, when, when is uh, cone beam the standard of care? And, and, you know, I know that's a loose definition. I know the yeah. lawyers can't agree on what that means. Yeah, I don't think it, it'll ever be explicit that it is necessarily the standard of care for such and such procedure. You know, we have a lot of different people saying it is quickly becoming the standard of care for things like implants, uh, maybe for wisdom teeth extraction when you see an overlap on the, on the panel of the wisdom tooth and the, the IAC. Uh, but I don't know if it'll ever explicitly you know, be put into law that's a standard of care. But does that mean it's not really going to be standard of care? You know, I'd hate to be a dentist where uh, I did an implant. You know, say I went into the, the endovelar fossa, did some damage, and then, then I'm in a courtroom and they show these images that someone took of this implant that's sitting there you know, outside the bone because I didn't know there was this big, deep fossa. You know, I'd hate to be in that situation. So... You know, whether it's standard of care or not, you know, I think it's, these are just things to consider. Yeah, I, I would say that um, the, the only thing I tell dentists, a lot of dentists, you know, they can, they can see a gazillion patients a year for 40 years. They get sued one time, and they just take it so personal. I mean, it's yeah, just that. like it's, it's so bad. And I, I always tell dentists that uh, 
Uh, the date I'm looking at is if you get practice, if you practice a full career, you're going to get sued at least once. And the only person issued about that is the malpractice uh, dental insurance company because they're the mm -hmm. ones that are going to write the bill for that. Just like I don't worry about wrecking my car uh, because sure. you know State Farm's going to have to worry about that, not me. But um, but yeah, I, well, do you have any market penetration data or gut instincts? Like, there's five thousand oral surgeons. How many of them do you think are using um, cone beam? For wisdom teeth and implants, Do you have any data? Do you have any intuition? I don't have any real data, um, but it, you know, it seems like more and more. It's still probably if I were just, I'm just going by gut, you know, less than half, 25, 30 percent. But it, it's constantly growing, and you know, I think in five, ten years, uh, maybe most of them will be using cone beam CTs. So you're right; it is less than half, and mm -hmm. I, I can I could rattle off ten names of oral surgeons that have placed thirty thousand implants and say. That just completely like I don't use surgical guide. Why would you mm -hmm. need a surgical guide for a single tooth? So Gordon, they, you know, they I, don't I, use cone beam either, or do they use cone beam to kind of map it out? Um, to see what I they're think a into? lot of them have cone beam just because they're you know if you sunk thirty thousand implants, you got more money than uh, you know Moses. You can you know <laughs> buy buy any, anything you want. So uh, you know I think they have them, but I just think they're old school boys that just sit there mm -hmm. and think you know what if you want to be a doctor, you're gonna have to learn how to lay a flap, and the faster you right. get after learning how to lay a flap, the faster you're gonna be a surgeon. And they, they don't like any uh, they they don't like any training wills things. They think you need to just lay it down yeah. flat. Now again, we're talking single tooth. Right. Where you got a tooth in front and behind. We're not talking about you know some edentulous person where you're trying to put you know four implants in there and you, you need to know where the metal foramens are and you right. need to know you know um, uh, you know et cetera et cetera. Um, so what um when should a dentist refer to a radiologist? Well, like I was saying, you know, I, I think there should be a lot more training. Uh, and I think once you're comfortable reading cone beam CTs, looking at what the normal anatomy is, and, you know, of course, you know, I think anyone would admit that every slice of the cone beam CT needs to be examined, needs to be looked at, and you need to be able to recognize normal from abnormal, so that means knowing what the normal anatomy is, what it looks like, what you should expect, what normal variations are, and, you know, that requires time. It requires looking at a lot of different cone beam CTs, but I think every dentist could get to that point where they're comfortable reading it. And once a dentist is to that point, you know, maybe just refer when you have a question. You know, obviously questions will come up. You know, even with, uh, at, at UW, with our team of radiologists, there'd be things where, where we'd discuss for hours and we didn't know what the heck was going on. So there, there'll always be questions that arise. And, you know, in that case, I think someone should refer it to a radiologist to have a look at and what do you think it's going to end up being? Like, does you know, does the eighty twenty rule come into play here? In which way? Do you think eighty percent of them are going to be standard and fine, and twenty percent need to be read, or do you think it'll be reversed? You think eighty percent will need to be read, and twenty percent um, will be uh, just normal? Well, it kind of depends on who it is referring. Are you talking about after someone has a question and then refers out to a radiologist with a question? No, just 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 the the average general? general dentist. So, so if, if all the general dentists bought a CBCT and, and their protocol for taking them, what, mm -hmm. what, what percent do you think overall do you think will probably okay. need to be read? I mean, I do you think really, it really depends ahead. on the comfort level of the dentist looking at it. Again, if he's got that additional training or, or tons of experience looking at them, you know, maybe he only needs on 5%, maybe he'll have questions. Um, conversely, if, if someone's fresh out of dental school, never looked at a comb and CT, Right up front, they, they may need someone to go over those with them and may need to refer every one of those out to someone to go through and talk about what the anatomy is and what they're looking at. And, and how does my viewer, if uh, when they get to work in uh, 30 minutes, uh, most people that listen to my podcast have an hour commute, how would they actually contact Anthony Meekum? Meekum or Meacham? Meekum. 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 Well, it was, it was from Meechum, but it, it's changed. And Meechum Meekum. is Meekum. <laughs> yeah. So so they go to oralradiologist.com. Yeah, oralradiologists, plural. Oralradiologists, plural, dot com, mm -hmm. or oralradiologists, plural, at gmail.com. But, but how right. do they send you, go through the specifics, how do they technically send you a CBCT? Because that's a big damn file. It, it is kind of a, a big thing to do, and I have... I've tried to carefully make some in, an instruction form on my website. Uh, if you go into, you have to look for where the instructions are, but there's a, a form that walks you through it. And, you know, most of them are saved in DICOM format, and what that means is hundreds of different files inside a folder. And what they're going to have to do is zip that folder. And again, I have instructions in that instruction form and in, in how to zip it and how to get it to me. But basically, if you go outside that folder and then 
it depends on what version of Windows you have, but you either have to right click it and then click zip or compress. Or in newer versions of Windows, uh, there's a share button up top. Once, once you highlight that folder, you click a share button up top in Windows and then it will say either compress or zip. And that saves it as a separate directory. Is compress and zip the same thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so that saves it as a separate file. It looks like a, another directory. And that you can upload right to the uh, right to the website. And if anyone has questions, you know, again, that email, uh, go on the website and look up my contact information. I can walk, walk them through it. Do you take phone calls? Yeah. Yeah, I take phone uh, calls enough, too. Enough to give out your phone number now, or would you rather they just go to oralradiologist.com? I'll give it out now. What, what's your uh, number? I might change it sometime soon because I still have the, the Boston area code number from when I was in dental school. I've never updated it because it's my cell phone, but it's 617-347-5670. Okay, say it again. 617-347-5670. And you'll keep, you should keep the Boston number because you're Irish and the Celtics. That's you true. Know? You know, Irish Catholic. <laughs> I, like, gotta, I like the Patriots. You got you to gotta, you gotta root for the Celtics. Uh, Boston Celtics and Notre Dame, if you're really right. an Irish Catholic, right? And uh, so, uh, so um, is it okay to refer out of state to radiologists? Is there any, any anything with that? I mean, you're not you're not licensed in Arizona. You're you're yeah, for the, uh, for Utah. For the most part, it, it's okay. You know, some people say it's kind of a gray area, but for the most part, you're fine. You know, if if you look at the uh, the laws that are in place, a lot of it is kind of gray area, and it's not really outlined. There are a few states where they explicitly say the, the I don't think they mention radiologists specifically, but if, if anyone does any sort of interpretation or diagnosing, they have to have a license in that state. And those states, I wrote them down here, it's New York, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Washington. So those five states are, are pretty explicit that the radiologist or whoever you refer to has to have a license in that state. And say those states again. New York, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Washington. And again, you know, you need, you need to look at the laws in your own state. I haven't... New York, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Washington. Mm -hmm. Huh. I just did not know there were teeth in Georgia and Alabama. This is, this is all, all news to me. I'm it's just probably not kidding. A out there. I'm from Kansas. And, uh, but anyway... um. Very, very, very interesting. And, and, and I, I want to give you, I want to ask um, some um, standard questions that I get from patients and dentists. Yeah. Um, um, just the, the obvious low barrier. Um, what is CBCT? Where the hell did they get that name? And, <laughs> and what, what does CBCT mean? And then there's a lot of people going around saying that, um, um, that like the care stream I bought, that technically you were like a scientist lawyer, it's not even actually a CBCT anymore. That was an earlier technology and that, they don't do it anymore. So, so what? Define what CBCT actually means. Where did the word came from? And mm -hmm. is the current CBCT is not really even a CBCT? Well, is that a newer CBCT? Your your care stream you're talking about? I mean, I, whatever is the new one was, like two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, cone beam CT, you know, means CBCT is for cone beam CT, meaning you know, compared to medical CT, which is. Uh, if we go to our traditional medical CT, it's a, a fan-shaped beam. They do now, is, one, is one a medical roll. Is the medical CT a CAT scan? Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah, it's called a CAT scan. Okay, so medical CT. CT. And that's, that's what people are maybe more familiar with in general. So a medical CT is a CAT scan? Yeah. See, my HMO. That's CAT scan uh, just kind of a, a colloquial name. My, my HMO, I own Obamacare. When I go to the doctor, uh, my CAT scan is they just bring in a cat. And it just walks around me and sniffs for about five minutes, and that's all it covers. But so a medical uh, a medical CAT scan mm -hmm. is where so your beam. traditional one is is a fan shaped beam where you, you just have one row of detectors and it goes around the patient. It's also called helical CT because it goes around in uh, basically the form of a helix. So you know many many times around the patient. Uh, of course, now that's kind of changing as they're getting multi-slice detectors. And if you go in any hospi hospital now, they're not going to have that single row of detectors because that takes so long to go around the patient you know, a thousand times or however many hundred times. But they have you know, either 32 or 64 row detectors. You know, it's getting up to the point where it's even like 128 rows, I think even more than that. And so it's, it's getting to where their, their beam, instead of being more of a fan, is almost like ours where it's a cone. And so there, there are people that agree with you. That's kind of a misnomer, the cone beam CT. You know, compared 
but the Combeam CT is inherently different. That we have a plat, fat panel. I can't say this. A flat panel detector, right? And it, it takes basically it's like taking a Ceph at each little increment around the patient, and you only go around the patient once. You know, we see it go around. It goes around pretty slowly, depending on your settings. And so you take several hundred Cephs of this patient, and it, and it takes each of these two-dimensional images, and from that reconstructs the the CT data. Whereas the helical CT or medical CT, you know, it takes you know, now we're up to several rows at a time, but it goes several times around the patient and takes like one axial slice at a time of the patient and then reconstructs it from those, reconstructs it from those axial slices. And so cone beam CT, uh, yeah, I can see where the name came from and we've kind of grown accustomed to it, but yeah, it is a bit of a misnomer because they are, as far as the cone beam, that's getting more similar to the medical CT now. And why did they go with the CT? Explain, first of all, what is the difference between a medical when you go to the hospital and they do a CT versus an MRI? What, what, what are they, what, why do you sometimes they get a CAT scan, sometimes an MRI? Is it because an old hospital uses the old CAT scan and a newer one uses the MRI? No, most or, of them have both now. And so, you know, CT, it's quicker, it's less expensive. Uh, there, uh, there's a lot more availability. If you have someone in an emergency situation, it's a lot quicker just to run them in, into a CT machine. It is, you know, similar to the cone beam CT where it's ionizing radiation using x-rays. And, you know, I kind of explained already how they reconstruct that with a, a medical CT. But an MRI, you know, that instead of using ionizing radiation is using magnetic, just basically a magnetic field. You sit inside this big magnetic field and then they have different ways of changing the magnetic field at different increments throughout the, the length of the scan. And that's a way that they encode the signal that they get so they, they have this big magnetic field, then they induct a signal, just another transverse magnetization or RF signal, and they have different ways of coding you know, each pixel inside the patient so that, that when they measure the signal coming off the patient, they can tell where it came from and reconstruct that as an image. So instead of using any ionizing radiation, it's just using magnetization, and you get an image from that. And it's, it's a lot better at looking at soft tissues you can look at discs. A lot of people will get them. You know, for dentistry, we may see them looking at TMJs because you can see the disc. Uh, you can see soft tissue a lot better. Whereas for CT or cone beam CT, you can see hard tissue. And, and, you know, another, and do, you, do you see MRIs eventually? Do you see these, uh, these cone beams eventually going to MRI, or is that just uh, logistically not really possible and will probably always be a CAT scan? Well, that's that's something where... Me and Dr. Hollander kind of disagree. He thinks that there's no way that MRI will ever be you know, low cost enough and small enough to be used uh, for, for dental. But they've already been doing some research with, they have to use super high magnetized MRIs to be able to, but they can image hard tissue. And they've shown, I've seen some research where you can actually see the hard tissue of, of the teeth and you can see the dentin and you can see it so much clearer than you can in an x-ray. So I think there's a lot of potential there whether they'll come down in cost and size is another story, but if you consider the biggest thing contributing to the cost and size of MRI is having to cool down for the magnets. They use an electromagnet, so they have to cool those coils down to become superconductors. They have to use liquefied helium in order to do that, and that's, that's what makes it such a huge, expensive, costly device. And so if, if they were able to, you know, come forward or advance enough in materials that they had a, a superconductive material that didn't have to be cooled that much, I think you could bring down the size and the cost of an MRI. I don't think it's going to happen anytime in the near future. We're a long ways from that. But, you know, maybe sometime in my lifetime we, we could see a dental MRI. You know, it's interesting because miniaturization is a business model that, that everybody does. I mean, when the steam mm -hmm. engine first came out, they, it was so huge they could only use it uh, to pump water out of coal mines. And then it got um, small enough to – then it could run a ship. And then it got small enough to run a train. And this uh, this iPhone right here, I mean, it's amazing <laughs> the, for how big the first computer was. And then it took a couple of decades and it was a, a personal computer. And now that damn thing's in my iPhone. You know what I mean? So yeah, so yeah, so every, just, everything always gets smaller every year except for my gut. Yeah. If you, uh, <laughs> if you look at the advancement of technology, you know it's it's just the trend. You can never rule anything out, and so I, I don't think you can say it, it'll never happen. But I, I think you can say it's not going to happen very soon. Yeah. So so then um so then are you okay? You know we're on the front lines. You got all all these general dentists and you got all these patients walking in. And are you okay with the with the 
the dental staff, the assistants, hygienists, and the dentist just saying, this is our new uh, um, CAT scan machine. We, we used to have a 2D X-ray machine, and now, now we have like a 3D CAT scan machine. Are you good with that, or is that wrong? Uh, I think if you say CAT scan, I think that's the wrong thing, too, because I think we, we definitely want to differentiate you know, our comb beam CTs, whether you call it comb beam or whatever you call it. I think you want to make sure to differentiate it from medical CT, mainly because of the dose and the risk associated with it. You know, so, you think, so you think that's a, the CAT scan has a bad brand name because they'll be thinking, wow, that's a lot of radiation. Is that what I, I just heard I don't think it's necessarily bad, but it, it is, you know, on average, say around 10 times the dose of a comb beam CT. And I think that's one of the huge advantages and one of the things that, that we should really talk about and focus about with comb beam CT is we're so much less dose, you know, yet we still get this 3D image. And, and you know, for the dental needs, it's, it's really a great... Do you, do you think we as dentistry, I, the funniest thing I ever saw a couple of years ago, the end, the, uh, the endodontists were trying to launch this campaign that uh, to quit calling it a root canal and call it endodontic therapy. And it's like, good luck with that. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, the yeah. whole world knows a root canal. It's kind of like in Phoenix. They, they, they quit calling these monsoons now. We have to call them haboobs. <laughs> but, in the, uh, but when you're out with all the real people, they all call it a monsoon. I mean, right. You know, like maybe one person – per summer calls it a haboob, you know what I mean? And uh, so do you think Dennis should get behind this and should we just start building a brand name CBCT or, um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm just telling the patients that we know we've gone from 2D, and now we've updated 3D, 3D. you call it a CD? I, yeah, I, 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 I would rather call it like X-ray. a dental CT, I think that's a, a that's dental, C, good, a dental, dental CT might be a good term. A dental <laughs> if CT? If I had to choose my terminology for it, maybe I'll just say, we're doing a 3D dental CT. So you can you can say how it's similar to a medical CT. And what's the CT stand for? Computed tomography. And you think that's a, a, a brand that you, that we could eventually have the all of America saying a dental CT? Well, it might be hard to uh, to overcome. You know, so many people already call it combing CT, and it's such a familiar phrase when talking about these. I don't know if that's ever going to go away. Yeah. So um. So tell us this then. What what is, what is um what is your biggest takeaway? Or give us some low-hanging fruit of what you didn't know on uh, reading a CBCT uh, versus what you know now after going through. Well, how long was the residency? Two years. So, so two two so years I'm, of just focusing on one thing. Uh, what what's some of the low-hanging fruit knowledge you could transfer to the general dentist listening? So the right the biggest thing I think that I had to learn over and over because I'm not smart and I had to hit myself in the head is you have to have a systematic way of going through things. Um, you know, first of all, you start looking through each slice, uh, each each different orientation, one slice at a time. But then you also need to look at okay, make a checklist. And, you know, do I did I look at the TMJs? Uh, did I look at the the sinonasal area? You know, anything that's in the field of view of the scan. Did I look at all the all of the dentition? You know, I I kind of got out of the habit of looking at the dentition as I got more and more into looking at at panels and looking at everything else around that I didn't see when I was a dentist. I got so into looking at that that I forget to look at the dentition and and not look at obvious caries. And so definitely you need a checklist. You need to make sure you're looking at every square inch of the scan. Do you have a checklist? I do. Is it on your website? Uh, uh, I don't have it up there yet. I'll put one together. Um, and could you could you start a thread with your checklist? Sure. Because on Dental Town, I'll tell you for you for marketing, you know when you post on Dental Town, you know that that's content. But in your signature area. You can have right. your name, you know, Tony right. Meacham, and uh, and or your oral uh, radiologist dot com and all that stuff. So every time you're mesmerizing them with your knowledge, they'll be seen in your signature area. You know, your your name and contact, and your avatar should be your face in dentistry, and uh, so all, all those things would be fantastic marketing for you. So so yeah, so the pilots. I mean, um, I um, one of my um, Ironman buddies that I run bike and swim with is uh, a pilot and. And he's always telling me that, um, you know, most of the plane crashes are solo practicing pilots. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest errors they make is they don't have a pre-flight checklist. And yeah. I mean, he's a professional pilot. And, and even being a professional for decades and decades, they still absolutely go things. through their checklist every single a, time. If you don't do a checklist, you, you will miss things no matter how many times you've done something. And so that's kind of when you get in a danger is when you've done something so much, you feel like, okay, now I'm comfortable with it. I can just fly through it and, and I'll see everything but if you, yeah yeah you miss things if you don't have that checklist right so um so you recommended um looking at everything in the same order so what are, what are your big takeaways is uh and, and we do that with patients I mean you know I uh 
Mm -hmm. One of my pet peeves that I can't stand is when uh, a little kid goes into the dentist to get a cleaning and the hygienist flosses their teeth. I mean, you don't see that in any other sport. You don't see, you know, when you go to uh, wrestling or karate or gymnastics or t-ball, you don't, you don't see the coach out there doing it while the kids sit down. The, the kids are doing it while the coach is coaching. And it's funny because I'll go in there and I'll, I'll hand a kid a floss, and you know it's the only time he's flossed in the last six months, and they usually go right, like, right to the middle teeth. And mm -hmm. I'll sit there and say, no, 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 no. We do it the same way every time. We start on the upper right and go around. And, you know, we start here, we go around, we drop down, we come back. Same thing with brushing. You just see areas where there can be, like, two plates of tartar on the buckles of their uh, – between their, you know, the maxillary molars on the buckle and then everything. And you can tell they, they've never brushed ever because they brush every time at the same time. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So yeah, I've, got, I've got four kids, and I still hold them down and brush every one of their teeth. You know, the, the older ones, the, the nine-, six-year-old. I let them do it on their own once in a while, but you know, I want to make sure it's clean, and I, <laughs> I give them a good cleaning every once in a while. I got, well, I got four kids too. We're, uh, we're, oh, yeah. yeah, mine are uh, 20, 22, 24, 26, all boys. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I, how I got two and two. My oldest is nine. Two and two. You mean two she's boys, two twin? girls. Oh, two boys, two girls. Okay. Right. And what are their oldest, ages? Oldest is a girl, nine years old, and a six-year-old boy, five-year-old boy, and then a two-year-old girl. And uh, we have one on the way. Just found out yesterday, another boy. Wow! Congratulations. I uh, I tried. I kept trying to have a girl, and uh, I never did. So that means I'll uh, die alone <laughs> in a nursing home, and no one will visit yeah. me. You know, you just needed uh, you just needed one girl, and you would have had a visitor in the nursing home. Um, <laughs> so what other uh, what what other low hanging fruit takeaways did you learn from uh, studying this for a couple of years? Uh, the biggest thing I learned was uh, just. The sheer, the sheer number of pathology, pathology cases, uh, I, I did research on reporting on comb beam CTs, and we had like 150 cases. Almost all of them, we, we kept a few normal cases in there just to keep us honest, but al almost all of them had pathology in it. And you know, that was, I think, one of the really biggest strengths of the program was you know, sitting down, again, with Lars Hollander, with the other great radiologists there, and just going through case by case and me coming up with a differential diagnosis. And you know, that's something hard that's that's hard to convey is just thing I think I can teach in a minute. You know, it's more something you need that experience of going through you know, case by case and seeing that much. But if I could take a minute, I want to go back to something I talked about. I think I may have opened a Pandora's box. You know, I don't, I may have given the impression that I feel like I'm not afraid at all about radiation and, and the dose we're giving our patients, which is not the case. You know, I, I subscribe to the Alara principle. There is the what principle? Alara as low as reasonably achievable as far as radiation dose. Um, as low as, low as re reasonably achievable. Huh. And I, I haven't heard that. You haven't heard that? I guess maybe that's more than common in the recent years, but pretty much every dental school is, is teaching that principle. They may change it soon to a lot of, I've heard talk of that, as low as diagnostically achievable. At our school, might make taught, a little sense. At our school, they taught uh, YOLA. You only live once, <laughs> and then they just blast you with well, everything they had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's changed a bit. But, but no, there is research, in fact, recent research that shows that the linear null threshold uh, dose theory is, is reasonable. You know, just in 2013 in Australia, they did a study of 11 million patients. Many, many of them had CTs, uh, either as, as children or young adults, and they do show a correlation with increased risk of cancer. And so that's you know, good data that shows low-dose radiation is a risk. You know, there's other theories out there, the hormesis theory, but you know, I do subscribe by the, the linear no threshold. I think that's good and conservative, and we should try to, to stay away from overdosing our patients. And so I think it's a great thing what the comb beam companies are doing now. A lot of them are, are focusing on the low dose. And you see some of these coming out with 15 or less microsieverts dose, and it, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is frustrating, though, when you uh, have patients come in that don't want a shot, and they're wearing 20 body piercings. <laughs> and in Arizona, you know, they come in and they don't want the radiation, the x-rays, and yeah. they're, you know, basically in shorts and a tank top, and they're like nuclear red-brown skin. And uh, the only uh, real good debate I got in uh, this month with x-rays, they had a pack of Marlboro red cigarettes in their pocket. And I'm like, I'm like, really? You're arguing with me about radiation and you smoke a pack of Marlboros a day? I mean, at that yeah, point. Yeah, it's, it's at good that to keep point, things in perspective. And yeah. I think it's fair to talk about your annual dose, which is about 3.1 millisieverts. <laughs> So you compare that to a bite wing radiograph, which is a thousand times less. You know, keep that in perspective. If they're just walking you know, outside throughout the day, every day they get 
the and, and, it's, and it's significantly more radiation if you live a mile high like Denver yeah. than Phoenix, right? Yeah. I mean, is that significant or not really? Uh, I'd have to try to remember, but it, it's it, it's pretty significant, like maybe 50% more. Yeah, because I always there. notice when I go skiing, like Breckenridge and Utah, or whatever. I mean, you're up there, you know, 10 to 15,000 feet. I mean, those, those are some of the wildest burns you ever got, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I only got you for a few more minutes. Any any other low hanging fruit that you can uh, tell these guys? Well, what can I think of? You're gonna start a thread on your checklist. Yeah, you need to remind me what all threads I'm gonna start. There were yeah, I, I I think the, I think the one checklist, on checklist one is is great. I mean, it's it's just like brushing and flossing. Every dentist gets that. I mean, you brush. Mm-hmm. You know, you brush the same way every time so that when you go in there and do your automatic, blah, 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 you hit it all. And I think going through the checklist would be a great thing. Um, and another one I think you should explain uh, um, how to uh, upload a case, you know, the instructions on how to actually sure. upload it. Yeah. And uh, and then another thing, I, 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 I'm always uh, talking to dentists, and, and uh, um, another thing is, uh, you know, um, they still struggle with what happens when a patient wants to copy the records. I mean, some people are burning them on CD-ROM. Some people are putting them on these uh, these little JPEGs. You know, um, um, do you uh, do you do any of that? I mean, can you fit them on uh, these uh, little uh, you know these little yeah, thumb you, drives? You can get pretty huge thumb drives. You can get you know, 64, maybe even 128 gigabyte thumb drives. How big of a for thumb that, drive? For that how, big, they're how, pretty how expensive. Big? But you only need how, you only need about 500 megabytes or less to fit a comb beam CT. 500 megabytes or less, and what would the average when when you go to Radio Shack, and you and now it's uh it's closed and it's a KFC, but uh if, if you if you go find a thumb drive, what what would be the average size thumb drive, and how average size probably eight. You can get anywhere anywhere from four eight eight, eight gigabytes. Eight gigabytes. Eight, Sixteen, thirty-two, maybe even sixty-four. And, and how big does it have to be to fit one of those CBCTs? Only half a gigabyte, so 500 megabytes. Wow. So, uh, so the, the so That's, do you, so you could really, you almost be a practice builder if you put your, uh, office name, uh, you know, you put your, uh, today's dental.com on the deal. And then what, what do you think about that? That's a great idea. You, know, you could get, get them cheap enough now, big enough to fit at least one comb beam CT and they'd basically be cheap enough that they're throwaway items. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause you, you said that a CBCT would fit on any of them, right? Cause you only need half a gigabyte and the ones yeah. that you buy at the store or, would you say two, four, six, or eight? Uh, four, six, eight. They may go up to like one twenty-eight gigabytes. But but like so one. the smallest one we're seeing a four, um, a CBCT fit. would fit on there. Uh, yeah, several CBCTs. So that that that's a I think that's a hell of a marketing, and um, you give a give a patient a copy of their X-rays. I mean that that's just uh, that's just amazing. I want to ask you another question. A lot of a lot of people are looking into um, instead of having a desktop PC. They're looking into uh, using the cloud, mm-hmm. and some people, some dentists are talking about. Well, I heard that's a bad idea because I got a CBCT and the files are too big to upload to the cloud. What would you say to that? I don't think that's the case at all. I think you know, with cloud storage, you can you can upload huge amounts of data. So, yeah, but but over what period of time? I mean, it, it, the, the standard average CBCT. If I was going to buy a practice management software that was cloud based, mm-hmm. how long? On the average internet connection, which I think most dentists have, whatever their uh, standard uh, cable TV. I think most dentists are using the standard cable, cable. internet. How, how long would it take to upload that file? I don't think it would take more than a couple minutes, unless you have really? a really slow connection. Yeah. So, that, so then that argument is just wrong then. Maybe I'm spoiled. Maybe I've had fast internet everywhere I've gone. but Okay. Yeah. I think if you have a decent internet connection, it shouldn't take more than a couple minutes to upload a combing file. And when someone sends you a CBCT, are you saving all these, or do you read them, write a report, send it back, delete, or how how long do you hang on to that CBCT? Well, I, I save them for now. You know, eventually, I probably will move to a cloud storage solution. Right now, I have my own server that I save it on. So until that gets full, I'm just going to save it myself. And you know, again, I'll keep a copy of the reports, email the the. Uh, the referring physician or the re- referring dentist a, a copy of the report, a link to a copy of the report. You can't just email it through email. That's not super secure, but you can email a link to it so they can open it up right off the server. Yeah. So and yeah, and so, so, everything. so you, you don't really think storage is going to be an issue then? I don't think so. You don't, you uh, don't I, think guess, I be- guess we'll tackle that when we get there, but you know, storage is getting so much cheaper and cheaper by the day. And Google, Google, this is uh, this is July first. We're taping this, and uh, 
Um, Google, what, what did it just last month where they slashed their uh, their cloud services cost in half? I haven't heard that, but oh yeah, they, yeah, they busted keeps, a big move. They just <laughs> nice. they just they just slashed it. I, I believe they slashed it in half. I mean, kind of nice. basically telling everybody we're 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 going big and cheap and fast. And yeah. uh, okay, okay. So uh, anything else? Um, well, I think that's it. Think we think we covered everything? I think we did. All right. Well, hey, uh, I got to tell you that uh, at 52, the um, um, when my my kids are older than yours, and uh, my oldest one made me a granddaughter, and I just want you to remember that your grandchildren will be a reward for not killing all four <laughs> children. So, uh, when, when I'll, you, I'll when, try to not kill them all. When, when you when you get to the point you're going to kill them all, remember there's a reward, and her name will be Taylor Marie. And uh, and she'll come uh, many rooms down the road. But uh, no, I, I loved every age of the kids. I mean, it was just a fun age. But I tell you, um, at 20, 22, 24, 26, it's it's even ten times more fun than they were two, four, six, eight because you know we're they're still all still just looking forward to when one of them's old enough to babysit and we can actually leave once in a while. So yeah, I'm from Kansas. So uh, in Kansas, uh, a babysitter was anyone who was one year older than you. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, those were back in the days without yeah, seatbelts. Yeah, more strict nowadays. Yeah. Well, hey, I want to tell you uh, good luck on starting your own business. And Thank I you. hope that uh, some, one of our viewers uh, um, starts helping you uh, with your new business. And I hope to, to see you on the boards. I think if you made some online C courses on how to read it, that'd build your brand name quick. I mean, it's all, all you want is. Do that, yeah. yeah, all you need right now, you have more time than money. So, uh, that's exactly uh, right. You know, so uh, put up some courses there. That'll build your marketing. I hope this podcast does. And uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. I got out of school in 87 and there were uh, no computers. I mean, all, you know, we just had charts. And I, and we thought we were lucky because we felt sorry for the class after us because they were going to computers and we were like laughing at them. And then here we are 20 years later, everybody's computers. And next, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, hey, best of luck to you and uh, best of luck on those four babies. And uh, thanks for spending an hour with me. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine. All right. Take care. You too.